Welcome to Worship at St. Paul's. I hope you have a wonderful 4th of July weekend. And this week, I want to remind you to sign up for our Iron Pigs baseball game. The whole church is going to go August 14th. We need signups by the 11th. If you're interested, go to our website for more ordering details. Next week, we're going to be sending the students off for a missions trip. We hope to see you all as we support the students. Uh, do great work in Philadelphia. Should be a wonderful time. And finally, there's an adult missions trip coming up. Go to our website for more information. We're looking for adults who are interested in serving the Appalachian Service Project. It's going to be a great time to get to know each other and serve communities as well. And now, let us join in worship. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart, and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> A reading from the prophet Zechariah and the text for today's sermon. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, 
on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. He will cut off the chariots of Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you double. The word of the Lord. Our first lesson from Zechariah is surely familiar because it's read in churches all over the world on Palm Sunday. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble, riding on a donkey. The words are familiar. The problem is they're familiar because of Palm Sunday, not because of the 4th of July. What shall we make of them? I recall one New Testament scholar raising an interesting textual problem. Luke and Mark have Jesus riding on a donkey, but Matthew, two donkeys. Most Hebrew scholars would suggest that what we have in Zechariah is a messianic passage written 500 BC, that the Messiah would be a savior of peace. Hence, he rides on a donkey not on a horse, which would be one on which a tyrant would ride. But this is the 4th of July weekend, and I want to return to this text and raise what I think is an interesting question. Whose donkey? All three synoptic gospels agree that Jesus sent his disciples into the village to get a donkey, except Matthew, who, missing the poetic parallelism, speaks of two donkeys. Jesus said, if anyone asks what you're doing, say, the Lord has needs of it and will send it back immediately. I think there's a July 4th sermon here. The Lord needs it. What do you have that the Lord needs? We assume that the owners got the donkey back. Jesus said they would, though there's no record of its return, just this quick, unembellished reference to the event itself, and no mention of the owner's name or names. Perhaps the owner was like Seth, Adam's other son. We all know Cain and Abel, but who was Seth? I have in mind people who would not be called power people, Yet on this 4th of July weekend, I think it's appropriate that we remember these unseen, nameless benefactors and we think of them for a moment. Only last week, a friend sent me a clipping. James Harrison needed 13 liters of blood when he was 13. He pledged to give blood when he was 18. And then it was discovered that his blood contained a rare antigen which cured rhesus disease. I guess that's RH factor. Well, James has donated over the years a thousand times and saved two million lives. I never heard of him. Or think of the teacher who inspired Shakespeare to write, the campaign manager who enabled Lincoln to get to the White House the man who hired Mozart to write his Requiem Mass, the woman who gave Lloyd Douglas the idea for his novel, The Robe. Did you ever hear that story? Her name was Hazel McCann and she lived in Canton, Ohio. And she wrote Lloyd Douglas and asked him if there was any legend about the man who acquired Jesus' robe after he was crucified. Well, the idea took hold of Douglas, and when the robe appeared, it carried a dedication to Hazel, and Douglas traveled to Canton to present her with a copy of the book. Speaking of Canton, 
I recall Adora Welty, one of the great Southern writers, telling in her memoir how her mother contracted septicemia and someone came from Canton, this time it was Canton, Mississippi, and brought down a bottle of champagne and that saved her life. What a story. Life is indeed a web of people and circumstances, and behind the great and famous is always a network of smaller people, often anonymous, with whom the famous ones would never become famous. I know we have a few members in this congregation who have graduated from the University of Richmond. Well, I recall that the chaplain of that fine college, he told of going to a graduation at Harvard where his brother was getting a degree. David Burns, chaplain at Richmond for 30 years, he spotted a long black limousine and his father said, look son, it's Conrad Adenauer, the chancellor of West Germany. He's gonna get an honorary degree. They waited and two old women got out of the car. Disappointed, Burns and his dad went their way, but later they learned that it was Helen Keller and her companion, Anne Sullivan, that they were in town to receive honorary degrees. It was a lesson that neither man ever forgot. What if it had not been Helen Keller and Anne Sullivan? What if it had just been two frail women who had gone to Harvard to watch their grandson graduate? God would have looked on the mystery of their lives with the same tenderness and love he felt for the women of fame and glory, for they too would have played an important part in the makeup and history of the world. Speaking of women, how ironic that when we think of this past week, it's young women who have had the courage to speak truth to power. Of course, they were immediately thrown under the bus, so to speak, but it was the conservative columnist Peggy Noonan who said it best. She's only a kid. What can she do? She cleans up kitch kitchen ketchup off the wall after the president has a tantrum and throws his plates. Just a girl. But she said such people can up and empires. While the men hide, it's the little ones who can upend the empires. She says sometimes girls don't get misjudged. Happy 246 Fourth of July to the great and fabled nation that is still to this day the hope of the world. I've been thinking for days why some 26-year-old who went to high school just across the river in Hopewell. Well, I read a big book a few weeks ago on whistleblowers, and I was reminded that Ralph Nader, when he blew the whistle on General Motors, General Motors went after him. They tried to find dirt on him any way they could, but he lived such a Spartan life that they couldn't find anything. And I remember a biblical scholar saying to me once, Prophetic voices come from the wilderness. Maybe when you're young, you have your whole life ahead of you and you think, you know, I think I'm gonna go on the right side of history, where when people are too wrapped up in the power structure of the day and they, they got a large family and, and, and they're worried about their careers, maybe it's harder for them to speak truth to power. Whose donkey was it? I don't know. And you don't know, but sometimes big doors swing on small hinges. Or I read this other article, a far less argumentative one, by a wonderful clinical psychologist. Her name is Mary Pfeiffer. I've read some of her books. And this article was titled, How I Build a Good Day When I'm Full of Despair at the World. And um, her new book just came out titled The Life in Light, Meditations on Impermanence. I ordered it from the library. They ordered five copies and I was number two. So I thought that was pretty good. But I did read reviews of the book and Mary Pfeiffer, after a long life says, 
most of us want to leave this world a better place. And she said, we know we cannot eliminate prejudice or nuclear weapons, but maybe we can deliver meals on wheels. Or maybe we can repair bikes for giveaway programs. She said, I'm sitting on my front porch and frogs are croaking and dogs are barking in the distance. And as I sit here, I think life is so terrible and beautiful at the same time. Do I have the capacity to hold it all together in my heart? And then at the last chapter, I'm told, she asks a lot of questions. You know, what influence are you going to have on your children and on your grandchildren? And I love these lines. Will they remember rolling walnuts down our hill to see whose was fastest? Will they remember my dropping fresh raspberries into their mouths as if they were goldfish? Will they remember that everything we did was so sacred that it became a ritual? And she said later, I don't know that they're going to remember all that, but she said, I'm sure that they're going to remember that they were loved and cared for. What legacy are we going to leave? I remember that line when Richard Rich has perjured himself and they come up to him and they hold the medallion for Wales. Richard, Richard, Robert Bolt says in his play, A Man for All Seasons, Richard, Richard, the Lord said, it profits a man nothing to give up his soul for the whole world, but for Wales? What I'm suggesting this morning on this 4th of July weekend is that in the economy of God, there are no secondary roles. All people are sacramental, capable of revealing God to us. And this means that the anonymous person who loaned Jesus that little donkey is just as important in the gospel story as the disciples themselves. I recall reading a newsletter published by a cooperative apartment in Philadelphia. It seems Bill could not start his car, a Toyota Prius, in a nearby garage. I spoke to a woman the other day, and she borrowed one of these things, and she was 10 miles from the garage, and she said, it won't start, it won't start. Well, they came all the way to help her, and it seems that it makes no noise. <laughs> Actually, the car was running, but she didn't know. It's hard to live in the modern world. Well, anyway, uh, Bill couldn't start his car, and it was in a nearby garage, and he was shocked when the garage attendant didn't brush him off, but took a genuine interest in his plight when he realized it was a Prius and that the jumper cables would not work. He got on the phone, he called a friend with the Prius and was able to get the car started. It, it, it seems the trunk had not been fully closed and thus drained the battery. Now, I don't know who this attendant was. I don't recall in the newsletter Bill mentioning his name, but don't you think I'd be amiss if I called him an angel of God, a witness of goodness and mercy? Don't you agree? In July 1798, William Wordsworth wrote one of the greatest poems in our language, and it had a rather long line. Lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey. The poem is really not about the abbey or anything else in nature. It's about memory and hope, joy and harmony. And early on is this lovely line, oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have felt in the blood and felt along in the heart that the best portion of a good man's life is his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. You heard these words recently in the news. A new mother couldn't get baby formula. Another mom had a freezer full of breast milk and she came to the rescue. I saw on television on the evening news the transfer of the milk from one woman to the other. Or here's a young mother who thought the diapers were two for one and didn't have enough money at the Walmart in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Carol Flynn, 73, who had enough 
money and worked for the March of Times, saw what was happening and quietly stepped up, paid the $120 for all those diapers. Well, someone in line took a video of it and it went viral and we kept hearing on the news all week about this woman's little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and love, or so she thought. And Jesus said, go into the village ahead of you and you will find a donkey, untie it and bring it to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs it and he will send it immediately. Whose donkey? I don't know, but God knows. And maybe all that, that's all that really matters. I think G.K. Chesterton would agree. Listen to his poem, which he appropriately titled simply, The Donkey. When fishes flew and forests walked and figs grew upon thorns, some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born with monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody on all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me, I'm dumb. I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one far fierce hour and sweet. There was a shout about my ears and palms before my feet.
us pray. O oh God, we yearn for companionship. If we can count our friends on more than the fingers of one hand, we are probably not counting friends anymore. All the more reason to thank you for those dear souls who accept us quirks and all and love us nonetheless. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we hear much about love at first sight, but little about hate at first sight, which is just as chemically potent and as prevalent in our world. So free us, we pray, from the need to put others down, knowing the price of hating another is loving ourselves less. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. On this 4th of July weekend, Remind us that true freedom is not the right to do as we please, but rather the opportunity of pleasing to do what is right. In your will is our only peace. So against everything that gets in the way of your will, even against us, be yourself, O God, and redeem us by such means as you will, out of our darkness into your light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we remember those in need and name them now before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we remember those whom we've loved and lost. They are still so dear to us, especially on a holiday weekend like this. Hear us as we remember them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these words, however broken, we offer you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.